Welcome, friends, enemies, and everyone in between, to my channel, The Masked Mormon. I am, in fact, The Masked Mormon. Why are you wearing a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? Oh, no, it's just they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. If you are returning viewers, I'm glad you could come back. If this is your first time here, I am a Mormon who used to believe in the truth claims of the Mormon Church. And now, I talk about it on the internet with you fine viewers. I do it in part to heal because the existential crisis that can result from a faith deconstruction is a pretty heavy experience. And also because Mormonism, let's just be frank, is downright fascinating. It's something that can get into your bones and even tickle your brain even after you stop believing. With Mormonism, we have the opportunity to see a religion develop from early in its history. There is a big difference between an organization that's only 200 years old versus an organization that's 2,000 years old. There's been a lot less time to hide its history in myth. Why, you may ask, am I sitting in the fires of hell? Well, intrepid viewer, today we are going to be talking about the devil. Thanks for stealing my thunder there, Mama. But yes, Beelzebub, Mephistopheles, the Prince of Darkness, that old serpent, the enemy of God, the father of lies, old Scratch, Azazel, the devil, or just plain old Lucifer. It seems as though the devil has been the boogeyman of Judeo-Christian religion since, I don't know, forever. Even in Mormonism, the pantheon of Mormonism has at least five main figures. The first is God, also known as God the Father, Heavenly Father, or Elohim, the head honcho, the big cheese himself. The second is Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, the pre-mortal Jesus Christ. Then comes the Holy Ghost, who just kind of does what the other two tell him to do. Then there's at least one Heavenly Mother, but we don't talk about my uh, other. We don't talk about mother. <laughs> Sorry, I will try not to sing again. And finally, there's Lucifer, who we're going to be talking about today. We will talk about the rest of the Mormon pantheon later, as I talk about the evolution of God. But in Mormon cosmology, Lucifer has been around since before the world was. He existed in the courts of heaven, with the rest of us. He is our spiritual brother. In that realm, we had been born spiritually to Elohim and at least one of his wives. We were without bodies, but Elohim had an immortal, glorified body. And Elohim wanted to provide a way for us to become like him. So a plan was presented where we would be given the opportunity to be, be, to be born into physical, mortal bodies and we would be tested to see if we would be obedient to his commandments. It was understood that we would fall short in sin, and that this sin would forever bar us from entering into the presence of Elohim again. So, a savior would have to be provided as a sacrifice for sin. Elohim asked who he would send as this savior, and our brother Jehovah volunteered as tribute. I volunteer as tribute! I mean, as our savior. But our brother, from probably another heavenly mother, Lucifer, saw a flaw in the plan. He recognized that a lot of people would be lost. They would choose not to follow the plan. So he suggested that he be the savior and that he would save everybody. In return, he wanted Elohim's glory. Elohim doesn't share his glory except for when he does. And because this would also take away from the agency of man, this plan was rejected. And so Lucifer and a third of the hosts of heaven, or a third of our spirit brothers and sisters, rebelled and were cast out of heaven to the earth. Here, they would tempt us and provide opposition, fulfilling a key component of Elohim's and Jehovah's plan. In the temple liturgy, 
Lucifer has a very important role. He tempts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and tries to lead them away from Elohim and Jehovah. He convinces Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Adam and Eve realize they are naked and are cast out of the garden into the lone and dreary world. Lucifer is then there trying to teach them the philosophies of men mingled with scripture. To hear it taught, it would seem that Lucifer has been around since forever. Mormon leaders have an oft-repeated line that says, Latter-day scripture and prophets confirm ancient teachings. But there really are no instances of a supreme evil in the Hebrew Bible. But wait, you may say, what about the serpent in the Garden of Eden? And all the other instances of the devil that are in the scriptures, like the book of Job, or even naming him in the book of Isaiah. Well, first off, the talking serpent in the Garden of Eden was just that, a talking serpent. In Jewish mythology, the serpent is a complex symbol. It represents cunning and deception, sure, but also wisdom, fertility, life, and immortality, and also the judgments of God. The interpretation of this serpent as the devil is a later Christian interpretation of the story, which was also adopted by Mormonism. Secondly, the figures described by Job and Isaiah are wholly different from the later Christian view of a devil. The word Satan does appear in the Old Testament a number of times, but not as a figure of supreme evil. The term Satan, pronounced Satan, is used to describe an adversary or accuser. When an angel appears before Balaam, you know, the one with the talking donkey. Hey, I can fly. He can fly. He can, he can fly. fly. He can talk. <laughs> the angel is described as a Satan or an adversary. The word is also used to describe individuals who act as Satans or Satans, also known as adversaries. For instance, when King David is described as a Satan or adversary to the Philistines. So besides adversary, Satan is also used as a term for an accuser. Think like a prosecuting attorney or even the concept of justice. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! In this context, the term is ha-satan or the Satan, which again could be a person or a divine being. We can see this in the book of Job. The Satan, or Hasatan, is a member of God's divine council. Hasatan claims that Job is only righteous because of his material wealth. So he seeks approval to take all of that away because he thinks that Job will then blaspheme and rebel against God. If one were to actually read the Old Testament in the order the various books were actually written, one would read the book of Job first. Even the book of Genesis hadn't been written down until around the time of the Babylonian captivity. If one reads the Bible in this fashion, they can start to see the evolution of different theological concepts, including Satan. Speaking of the Babylonian captivity, that is where a more modern conception of Satan as a being of pure evil starts to take shape. As stated, Judaism didn't have such a being. But after they're carted off to Babylon, things start to change. The Babylonians were eventually conquered by the Persian Empire. As the Judeans were under Persian control, they were introduced to the ancient religion of Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest practiced monotheistic religions in the world. As Judaism interacted with Zoroastrianism, new theologies were developed. Zoroastrianism has a dualistic cosmology, a philosophy of good versus evil. In it is the god Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda is an all-powerful god of absolute good. He has a great adversary of absolute evil named Angramainu. Is this starting to sound a little familiar? As Judaism and Zoroastrianism interacted, the idea of Satan being the antithesis of God began to develop. This theology was carried back to Jerusalem when King Cyrus of Persia 
allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem in 539 BC. In between the Old and New Testaments, the Dead Sea Scrolls record further some of this development. Extra biblical apocalyptic texts, texts in this period record narratives of various Satans and the struggle between goodness and evil, light and dark. So I say do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Even the New Testament view of Satan has a Zoroastrian heritage, not an Old Testament one. But I can hear you screaming at your screens right now, but what about the devil being named and present in the book of Isaiah? He's called Lucifer, and his fall from heaven is described for heaven's sakes. This is, of course, referring to Isaiah 14, 12 through 13. Let's read it real quick. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's in the New King James Version. But let's look at another translation of this verse. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. That's in the New International Version. You notice that the name Lucifer is not in the second translation at all. Why is that? Well, Lucifer isn't even a Hebrew word. It's Latin. So how did a Latin word end up in the Old Testament? Well, in Greek mythology, one of the stars of heaven was named Phosphorus. Yes, just like the mineral. Phosphorus was the Greek god of the morning star, also known as the planet Venus as it appeared in the morning. As the Greeks were eclipsed by the Romans, who spoke Latin, Phosphorus became known as, you guessed it, Lucifer. Out of context to a Christian or Mormon who carries thousands of years of theological development, this could sound like a retelling of Lucifer being cast out of heaven and becoming the devil. But proof texting is something a lot of religions like to do to support their positions. A verse of scripture will be read out of context because it seemingly holds up a certain claim. But one just has to back up a few verses to the beginning of Isaiah 14 to understand what this chapter is even talking about. Verse 4 makes it very explicit who is being talked about. These verses aren't talking about some pre-mortal war in heaven, but are taunting the king of Babylon. The Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Latin in 382 AD. And because the Romans used the name Lucifer when referring to the planet Venus as it appeared in the morning sky, this is how the name for a Roman god for the morning star passed into the Christian lexicon and eventually became the name for the most reviled figure in Christian cosmology. But that's not all. Not only do we get the name for the ultimate evil from Greek and Roman mythology, but a lot of how he is visualized in the Western world comes from there as well. Lucifer as a horned being started with Greek mythology as well. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm going to lead you down the path that rocks. In Greek mythology, the god Pan is the god of shepherds, the wild, and of music. The imagery of the god Pan has the lower body of a goat, cloven hooves and all, and the upper body of a man. He was sometimes depicted with the head of a man with goat-like fe goat -like features, like pointed ears and horns. Other times, he was depicted with the head of a goat. Is this starting to look familiar? Pan was a being who was given to erotic and lustful pursuits and noted for his large phallus. That's what she said. <laughs> Pan had a chaotic and wild personality. He was very mischievous. At the same time, he was very jovial and affable when he wanted to be. His imagery eventually became associated with anything pagan, and therefore evil, to early Christians. 
anything that wasn't in line with orthodoxy became the domain of the devil. Pan represented the animalistic side of humanity and came to represent what Christians sought to quash. This imagery really began to develop in the Middle Ages and continued to evolve with the artists of the Renaissance and with literature from authors like Milton and Dante and eventually developed into the beastly appearance that is recognizable by the modern world today. Even now, the evil seed of what you've done germinates within you. No, you lie. You disgust me. You're nothing but an animal. <laughs> we are all animals, my lady. <laughs> that said, Mormonism doesn't readily accept this imagery. Lucifer is depicted as being in human form, a man without a body. He opposes the plan of salvation. He tries to entice and tempt people to use their agency to rebel against God. Joseph Smith believed in spirits and magic, and this included an active Satan who presented himself before one of the most important events in Mormon mythology, the first vision. And as such, Mormonism believes very much in an act of Satan. However, much of this belief is a carryover from earlier Christian influence. Lucifer is at least as important as any of the other figures in the Mormon pantheon. Well, with the exception of Heavenly Mother. She's more of an afterthought. But we have seen that the concept of Satan as the embodiment of all evil is a fairly recent invention. We can trace the origin and evolution of this belief over the centuries. It became necessary to have such a figure because if the Christian God, like Ahura Mazda, was all powerful and absolutely good, there needed to be a way for evil to enter the world. Enter Satan, a word that represented an accuser or prosecuting attorney, evolved into the devil. During my faith deconstruction, as I dove into the history of Satan, I came to realize that he simply doesn't exist. People are plenty capable of perpetrating evil on each other. There is no need for a boogeyman to act as a scapegoat. You and I are responsible for the good we do and for the evil we do. No devil is necessary. Some may echo what the usual suspects says. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. But this is a story that has been thousands of years in the making. But we can track how it started and how it changed over the centuries. Having a devil to blame all evil on is, I think, just a deflection. I think as a species, in order to mature and grow out of our hatefulness, we need to take responsibility for our own evil and not pass it on to mythical figures. Own it correct it, and move on from it. But what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Am I the devil because of my denial of his existence? Let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe and share. And I will see you again soon. <laughs>